Hi, this is Daryl Kulak. I'm doing a video about a trip that I took to the IEEE conference. It stands for International Society of Systems Science, and this was in Washington, D.C. I thought it made sense to do a video on this uh, because I've been talking about systems thinking for a long time. I think I probably don't explain it very well when I'm talking to pillar people, and so this is my attempt to start to introduce that topic uh, at Pillar and uh, hopefully provide some initial uh, introduction to it as well as uh, a kind of a trip report on what happened with this conference. So it was in Washington DC, it was about a week and uh, the first thing is I really missed Chef Jeff. We had tacos, we had uh, pizza out of a box, the, the lunch was less than impressive. The food for the lunch was less than impressive. However, the lunch partners that I had were really, really interesting. And that's the kind of the first thing I'd like to talk about. The uh, first day that I had lunch, I was really going to try to break out of my shell and try to introduce myself to some people and, and uh, get to know the other people at the conference. It was an academic conference, so there were lots of professors and PhD students, and that was even true with my first lunch conversation. There was a professor in systems thinking who was from Pakistan. So he talked about uh, different problems they have in Pakistan with the, with the military uh, that had taken over the country for a number of years and a big dam project that was being built that uh, was way over budget. And, you know, I assured him that that was not unique to Pakistan. That was something we experienced all the time in the U.S. as well. But he was an interesting lunch partner. At the same table was a Ph.D. student in systems thinking who was attending college in England, but he was originally from Saudi Arabia. And so you can imagine just the great conversation that occurred just with all of us being from different backgrounds like this. The, that evening, uh, for any of you who know my wife, Tamara, I gave her a call and I told her about this great lunch that I had. And uh, she always likes to challenge me. So she said, well, that's great that you had that on the first day. Let's see if you can do better tomorrow. I thought, oh my gosh, how am I going to do better? I mean, Pakistan is on the other side of the world. How can I get further away than this? So I tried, I took up her challenge and I thought, how can I do better on the second day? So second day I had great conversations, side conversations, with uh, a couple of people. One was uh, an a man, older man from Ireland who is now living in China and married to a Chinese woman. And uh, also in this conversation was a man from India, a systems thinking professor, who now works in Australia. And so again, just incredible comparisons of different cultures and and talking about what it's like to work in these places, to live in them. It was great, another great conversation. So again, I called my wife the next, that night, and said, wow, okay, I guess I outdid myself. And her challenge back was, that's great, honey. Let's see if you can do better tomorrow. So during one of the breaks in between the sessions, I uh, actually had a great long conversation with a very nice young man who was a Buddhist monk. He lives and teaches in Taiwan and uh, he is a systems thinking professor as well as uh, uh, a monk at a monastery. I'm not sure how that all intermixes and, and how much time he spends in each one of those jobs, but he was a really, really great conversation partner and we had lots to, to talk about and compare. I even found out how uh, Chinese cell phones work because you it, you know there's several hundred Chinese characters. How do you fit all those buttons onto a phone? And uh, you actually type things in phonetically is what I found out. So uh, so he he taught me a lot of different things and we got to know each other and we're still uh, keeping contact. When I'm talking about systems thinking it seems like in the US, uh, certainly with my pillar colleagues, but our clients, uh, 
when when I just talk to different different people about uh, systems thinking, most people are not very familiar with the systems thinking school that I am inter most interested in. And so when I talk about the scholars, the different scholars who who I am, I, I read books and and follow their teachings. Most people have not heard of these uh, of these folks. So to go to this conference and to be around the other uh, professors and the students and and even some consultants who absolutely know all of these scholars was just like being in paradise for me. <clears throat> so, oh yes, you know that that guy Rosen. I don't think he really started blossoming until he hit his second book, rather than getting blank looks from people. Oh, Checkland, uh, you know, be sure with Checkland that you follow his methodology. He really doesn't like it if you don't follow all the all the parts of it. Or, you know, that guy, boy, he really likes his single malt scotch. The background stories of all of these scholars that I've been kind of following over the last six, seven, eight years, uh, it was just really, really fun to be amongst all these folks. And some of the people that I follow actually were there in person. Uh, some of them have have passed away over the years, but uh, there were a number of the scholars who I've followed who were actually at the conference themselves. So this is a place to be. And what I found out over the course of the conference is it started to gel with me what the real definition of systems thinking is. So if I were to define it, I would say systems thinking is the science of connections. That's it. So it's connecting different parts of uh, a cell in an organism from a biological perspective. It's, it's multiple cars on a freeway and how they interact with each other. It's the connections between things. It could be the connections between the elements of an ecosystem. It could be the connections in a weather system. It could be the connections of people in a team or an organization. And that is really how, what I'm most interested in. I think there is a tremendous amount for us to learn uh, in terms of, hey, is this your fault or is this my fault? What if it's the fault of the connection? What if that's where the problem is? And we need to look at that relationship and redefine it or change it or rethink it and and that's really where where the issue is and a lot of systems thinking points in that direction there are, are two schools well there's there's dozens of schools of systems thinking but there are two kind of big segmentations and that's the hard systems thinking and the soft systems thinking so it may be that when you've heard that term systems thinking it's been applied to six sigma or lean manufacturing, uh, cybernetics, systems dynamics, those are much more popular, especially in the US, than the soft side. So the soft side is where this conference was focused on. There was actually another week that occurred afterwards that I didn't go to that was more focused on hard systems thinking. Uh, but these two areas are kind of feuding between each other for supremacy and really the hard hard systems thinking side is definitely winning. If you look on the soft systems thinking side, uh, we have the soft systems methodology. We've got critical systems thinking. Uh, Robert Rosen, who I showed a picture of a couple slides ago, he is a he, he's he's gone now, but he he was a big uh, influence on a lot of people, especially in biology, for the the systems science that he has put forth. There's also something called the Hull School in England, uh, and they there were several people from Hull School there uh, at the conference, and they are a huge influence over today's soft systems thinking, and uh, it, they're just really interesting people to talk to, and they've done a lot of great work on this side. If you had to characterize between hard and soft, I would say that the hard systems thinking is a mechanical way of looking at things. So everything fits together, uh, everything works like a machine, and and if you've got people then you just figure out kind of how what how they fit as two cogs in the wheel uh, rather than looking at the more human side of things. 
and in in contrast on the soft side the these these are where you have systems that have people in them so people have different perspectives people have emotions uh, people uh, may be rational or irrational uh, they they are acting rational within their own logic but from an outsider's point of view they may look irrational so you have all of these other complexities that you do not have on the mechanical side there is a beautiful phrase that's used in soft systems thinking in the soft side and it's called action research and what 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 I really like about it I guess I had I had a reservation about coming to this this conference and that was that it would be completely academic there would be theories about things but nothing of it would be practical and the action research phrase and the and the whole I guess school of thought of action research is that you can put forth a theory but it means nothing until you've done something about it to try to make the world better with your theory so it has to connect to action action research research by itself we're not interested don't even come to the conference don't try to do a presentation we want to see how it relates to real life and how you're making the world better and I thought this was a great way of looking at things we actually have the opposite problem in in consulting I think because we tend to focus more on the practical so what what have you done to make the world better but we have no connection back to a theory and so I think this action research is is a thread that should run through everything it should run through the work that the people are doing in academia the professors the students and it should run through everything we do in consulting that if we move forward with some new best practice that that actually should be connected back to some theory that actually helps it all make sense at a theoretical level I think we're in danger if we don't uh, that's partly because we don't know why we're doing what we're doing we may be copying a best practice from some, somewhere else and we don't know why it worked in the other place so if you've ever heard me talk about best practices uh, you'll you'll know that I'm really not that crazy about the term it's it's the best part of the practice that that I'm very concerned about to say that there's a practice that works everywhere and uh, to me the there are practices that are good uh, in certain contexts and so the whole idea of scrum certification or all of the mechanical things that we try to put around agile uh, are um, in the best practices mode and I think are very dangerous they we say hey if you use this it'll work perfectly and if you're if it's not working perfectly it's your fault because you didn't use it right it's it's nonsense I try not to use this term best practices some of the presenters who were in the systems thinking conference were just amazing people uh, this slide is about a, a Singaporean teacher who used soft systems methodology in her classroom to help her t help her students write better stories so her students were kind of elementary school level and uh, they were having trouble uh, writing good stories they didn't make sense they didn't follow uh, a logical sequence and so she started using a systems thinking process to help them what she did is she focused less on how each student was doing individually so kind of looking at them students in isolation and instead she started measuring how much they were helping each other so were the students who were doing better work better writing better sentences and stories were they helping uh, the the students who weren't as good and if she was focusing on this kind of the relationships between the students could she get her numbers to increase and in fact what she found is their test scores went much higher very very quickly in just in just a few weeks of doing this uh, after she was focusing on relationships rather than trying to split the students up into individual uh, individual focuses so that was a very interesting application I thought another presenter talked about a water system in New Zealand and uh, there was a public water system in part of 
New Zealand, the agricultural part that provides a lot of the of the food for the rest of the country. And this public water system was broken up into nine separate private water systems. And so the uh, these were sold off and different people owned each one of the nine water systems. And when they asked these businessmen who owned them, uh, do, we, do you think we need oversight over all of the nine systems? They said, oh, no, of course not. Why would we need that? And the systems thinking professor who was doing action research with this, uh, with this group pulled in someone from the ecology side. And, and the ecologist, of course, said, well, we want to make sure that we don't run out or somebody doesn't use too much. So of course we need some type of oversight. So they did establish a, a government oversight. Now you might think a government oversight would be the, the, the group to create a bunch of rules and to enforce the rules and to arrest people who are doing this stuff wrong and all that kind of stuff. They actually took a much more lightweight approach. So they, they cr created a, a view for themselves that they needed to be the group to make the statistics big and visible. So they published multiple times a day, they published the usage of the water systems among the nine groups and they published it to all nine. And so they they found that just publishing the information back to the groups actually helped uh, enforce uh, the, the, the keeping away from the problems of there being overuse of the water. So just by making the, the data big and visible, the problems started to solve themselves and, and the group almost became self-enforcing. And so that was, you know, uh, systems thinking applied to uh, a water system in New Zealand. Another presenter, this was really impressive to me, was a, a negotiator basically between countries. And he uh, was a Cypriot, so he was from, from Cyprus. And Cyprus, I don't know if you, it's a, it's a little island in the Mediterranean, but it uh, is very divided between north and south, between the Turkish side and the Greek side. And they hate each other, they never talk to each other. There's this big line, actually goes right through the capital of uh, Nicos Nicosia, I guess. I'm not sure how you say it. And um, so there's this huge problem there and he started doing some negotiation with the groups there. He became a, a kind of famous with some of the results that he got and of course he got pulled into the uh, negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. And he uh, has been working with those groups a lot. He described some of the problems he's, he's faced like in these situations. He had a negotiating table four Israelis on one side, four Palestinians on the other. Had their first day of negotiation, everything start, everything was going well. That evening he got a phone call and said, hey, we're only going to be sending three Palestinians next uh, to the next session. He said, why? What happened? He said, well, one of our people has been kidnapped and is being beaten by Hamas, and so they won't be there. And uh, sure enough, the person uh, did show up a few days later and had the scars and bruises from the from the beatings that occurred uh, by the terrorist group. So there, there, he had all kinds of big problems he needed to deal with that go far beyond the kind of political situations we have to deal with on our projects. But you know, there is still a, a link, and certainly it seems like uh, there are things that we could learn from this negotiator that would probably work with our clients as well. There are a number of special interest groups with this, uh, with this society, uh, and they call them special integration groups because, of course, it's systems thinking. Uh, the one that most interested me was the Systems Drinking Society. And so I spent a couple of fairly long nights uh, in the bar with a number of the people from the group, kind of the, the guy really likes his single malt scotch, that kind of systems thinker and uh, got some really good information from those sessions as well. One fellow that uh, that was in the Systems Drinking Society, uh, his name is Dennis, and he he has been to eight, has lived in 18 different countries in Africa. And his job, his job for the last 45 years, he's retired now, 
but his job has been for many many years to be the leader of aid projects in in uh, poverty stricken countries and so he has worked in all these different countries in Africa uh, and has uh, helped them with digging wells for water or with HIV uh, with medical uh, with uh, malaria he's just you know when when the government of Switzerland says we're gonna we're going to allocate 18 million dollars to uh, helping an, an Af helping with water in Africa uh, this is the guy that they go to and they say here's the 18 million go set something up and make this make us you know proud and so if you can imagine the kind of political things that he had to deal with that the warlord just came in town and started shooting things up and you know all of these crazy things that can occur uh, it, when you're uh, doing these kind of projects but he he did a number of things for many many years in Africa uh, he was he did quite a few projects in Southeast Asia in the Philippines in Indonesia and he also uh, did projects in South America so he's a very well traveled guy if you can imagine the joy of sitting in the bar with this guy listening to the stories of the different places it was just really incredible one thing that he stressed that really rang true to me is he said when you have these big aid projects you have a project manager so you have somebody who manages the whatever Gantt chart or you know the cards on the wall there's somebody who has that type of expertise and that type of that type of personality and mentality he said but then there has to be a second person and he said that person deals with the political so this would be going back to the Swiss government and trying to make sure that you get your money this would be dealing with the warlord who has just rode into town and wants to you know shoot every shoot everything up this is dealing with supply problems it's just dealing with all the political stuff what he said is he has never seen a situation where that can be the same person so he Dennis was the was the political guy he was not the project manager type he always hired a project manager but he always dealt with the political issues and you know would figure something out would would figure out what the warlord really wanted and, and try to negotiate something he would uh, he would uh, take take somebody out for drinks or whatever it took he would he would make sure that the project got back on track again from a political aspect and what worries me about pillar is how much time do we train our own people or do we talk about the political issues rather than just complaining about them what kind of framework do we have that we can go through this and we can solve these kind of issues or we can mentor each other on getting better at solving the political issues because when you look at the problems we've had on different projects very seldom is it a technical problem or even that our team is underperforming anything like that it's usually some type of political problem that has rained down on the team and the team can't figure out how to deal with it so when I look at opportunities for pillar I see three possible opportunities one is we could participate with the PhDs uh, to get proof that our practices work more on that in a minute I think we can also learn from a group that's called the ICCPM uh, the International Center for Complex Project Management more on that in a minute then I also want to talk about this cultural research what I learned from Dennis about how do we actually address cultural political issues so connecting PhD students to our industry a bunch of you know there were a bunch of PhD students there of systems science they were all looking for tough topics that they could tackle and quite frankly I don't think they all found them so some of them were giving fairly lame presentations about kinda non-issues uh, that I don't think they were really helping make the world better so I think with pillar we could we could help them because we have these requests from clients saying how can I really be sure that this works how can I be sure that the way that pillar develops software with test driven development putting cards up on the wall whatever the pieces of what we use the value stories how can I be sure that this works if we had a PhD student doing a study of this and they did their thesis on here is the pillar approach here is why you know here is here here are the results of what we've seen how it works this is the kind of study we could give to a client and say here here is something from Hull University PhD student 
who looked at what we do and who said uh, this really works and and here here is the here is the academic information behind it I think that'd be quite valuable to the PhD students and to us as well the ICCPM uh, was introduced to me by a, a consultant who was uh, one of the presenters and here when you look at this group we've got Australian Department of Defense we've got British Aerospace Lockheed Martin Hitachi these are companies that have really really giant complex issues to solve on their projects and they've looked at typical project management so you know project management institute PMP certification and they've said that that just is not helpful to us it's it, we need something beyond that they also have looked at all the agile processes and they they've said this is not enough we need to get something beyond this and what they've what they've come up with is that systems thinking is the next step after PMI st style project management and after agile and I kinda think they're right uh, so I wanna c follow what this group is doing and see what we can learn from them and see what we can incorporate into into pillars processes when you look at this is from a white paper that uh, ICCPM has put out um, and when you look at how, what they study its culture its communication its relationships resilience collaboration and competition they are focused on the cultural issues the soft issues the people issues they are not trying to turn this into something mechanical now again when I look at how we deal with our you could say engagement model or delivery model I think we are still pretty mechanical and and I I've been involved with all these efforts so I'm not pointing fingers I think I have helped to produce something that's fairly mechanical we don't talk very much about politics in in our orientation for delivery model or engagement model we uh, don't talk very much about culture so I'm wondering what can we learn and where can we learn it uh, I've uh, come across something called the Cultural Intelligence Center it's actually based in Lansing Michigan so we could probably go visit them and they look at the cultures of different countries and they've established 10 different cultural dimensions of countries and and where everybody is on the scale so it's uh, being versus doing uh, it's uh, it's how much how do how do countries treat time is it like I've got an appointment with you at two o'clock I'm gonna be there right at two or if it's like hey you know maybe I'll be there at two maybe not no big deal different countries have different approaches to cultural issues and when I've, I've, I've been in contact with these folks and they said the same applies to corporations and so we need to figure out where our clients fit on all these different scales these different dimensions of culture and how can we fit in with that and how can we uh, how can we be successful even though their culture is different than pillars there's another uh, another framework that's called spiral dynamics that looks at uh, different types of cultures in corporations uh, and kind of gives them a, a, a color coding so a red culture is one that's very uh, top-down kind of military uh, you know you, you do what the leader says you don't question it which actually I think the US military has moved past that but there are still companies out there like that are like this then you have these different types of colors of, of corporations and how you deal with them and how you may change them or may just adapt to them uh, over time as you're consulting with them so I think I think we need some tools in these areas and I don't think we have them yet I'm, I'm throwing out a couple of options here there are probably much better ones out there maybe that you know about that would be interesting to talk about so the next the next thing I'm interested to to focus on this group is actually having their next conference in Berlin next year I really am thinking about going I'm interested if other pe pillar people can come with me it would be very cool um, but uh, I think we have a lot to learn w about systems thinking and I think we can learn it from this group and I worry about uh, if if pillar is really still too much focused on agile as a core competency 
and we need to think about what's next. And what I'll put forward is I think systems thinking may be the next thing. And I think we, we can learn from the academic work that's already been done and the action research that's already been done. And we can start partnering with different factions of this group to find out how we can make Pillar better.